In the Gun, episode number 41, we've got to talk about some Mountaineers moving up and getting accolades and awards and recognition in their field. It's been an exciting week or so here for some former Mountaineers, and we shall discuss. I'm Wesley Euler with the best teammates in the business, the signal caller, Jed Drenning, and the runaway beer truck, Owen Schmidt. This episode of ITG brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You always find the latest odds, team matchup information, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and live scores for almost any sport or game imaginable. It's the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite leagues and events. So head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use the promo code BELIEVE when you sign up to receive your rewards. That's B L E A V at Bet Online, where the game is starts headlines here and like i said we've got plenty of them because it's it's been an exciting week or so here for some of our uh, our mountaineer brethren across a couple different platforms here so let's start maybe where we should in, in chronological order because you know when we last released our episode uh, episode 40 last week it came out right before the nfl honors night it came out right before the nfl announced it's Hall of Fame class for 2023 as well, too. And Mr. Drenning, a former Mountaineer, finally getting that Canton call. Chuck Howley, and it's about time. You know, he's he's 86 years old. By the time he's actually enshrined in August, I believe he'll be 87. Uh, this is a guy who played at West Virginia in the 50s, came in on kind of the tail end of those Freddie Wyant teams. You know, he was younger than those guys, but played into the late 50s. Spent a couple years after being drafted by the Bears in Chicago, uh, but people uh, recognize him as a Dallas Cowboy, and for good reason, right? He spent many years, the better part of 12, 13 years in Dallas, and of course became famous uh, for a couple reasons in Super Bowl V against the Colts. Reason number one, he was the first MVP on the defensive side of the football in the Super Bowl, and reason number two, uh, the first MVP on the losing side of the Super Bowl. Now, it's kind of strange. Like, I heard people even will talk briefly about the Super Bowl here after a bit, but maybe Jalen Hurts should have been the MVP in this. Here, this was a different animal. Okay? You never see that anymore. Super Bowl five was a different animal. It was, I think, not even close. The single ugliest Super Bowl ever played, okay? I'm too young to remember it, but I have NFL films and John Vicenda, right? I mean, this was a game in which, you know, the, the winning team, the Colts had seven turnovers. The losing team, the Cowboys, had 10 or 11 penalties. It was just ugly. And in that ugly environment, uh, Chuck Halley flourished. It wasn't even really him gobbling up a bunch of tackles. Uh, he was front and center with some of those turnovers. He had a couple picks. He had a fumble recovery. So he played a critical role and kept Dallas hanging in it when they really struggled offensively. But very ugly Super Bowl. But anyway, long story short, so glad to see Chuck Halley finally – get the call, a call that, in my estimation, is long overdue, a West Virginia great, a Dallas Cowboy great, uh, a guy that's meant a lot to the, uh, to the game of football. And it was pretty cool how he received the news. You guys probably saw it, where they had yeah. Roger Staubach, his former teammate, show yep. up and give him the news. That, uh, that was kind of the cherry on top for me, but couldn't be happier for one Chuck Halley. It was pretty cool. It really was. And you're right. I love seeing seeing uh, Roger Starbuck be the one to, to knock yeah. on his door and give him the news. And you're right, Jed. I mean, pretty cool piece of history in terms of uh, first defensive player to ever win Super Bowl MVP, first and I believe only right uh, yeah. player on the losing team that has yeah. ever won Super Bowl MVP. He's the first and the only. Fun fact for you gentlemen, WVU is the only school in the country that has a Super Bowl MVP who didn't win the Super Bowl and an NBA Finals MVP that didn't win the NBA championship because Jerry West was Finals MVP one year when the Lakers lost to the Celtics in the final. So a little interesting piece of wow. WVU history for you there. We have uh, we have a guy who won Super Bowl MVP but didn't win the yeah. Super Bowl and a guy who won NBA Finals MVP but didn't win the NBA championship. I did not know that. That's and, pretty remarkable. And I stick to this, Owen. Otis Anderson played a great football game in the Super Bowl against the Bills, but to me, Haas was the MVP of that game. I stick with it. <laughs> but, Jed, we can't argue with the signal caller. I mean, we can't do it. We can't do it. I'm going to talk about uh, one of 
a guy that Owen might have a little bit more to say here about in, uh, in just a second. But this episode of ITG also brought to you by our friends at Toothman Ford. Make sure you're checking them out, doing some great stuff with WVU NIL. We all know cars cost less in graft, and you go to their website. They've got a great um, just inventory tool and, and navigation system on their website. Uh, make sure you're showing some love to our friends at Toothman Ford. Owen, I'm wearing this shirt as well, too, because I feel like we got to mention, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm wearing the, the okay. Geno Smith shirt. And, you know, I know you you and Geno's time didn't have any direct crossover, but both Mountaineers, both played for the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, pretty cool to see. We all know that Geno Smith, you know, starting with week one, they wrote me off. I ain't right back, though. And it kind of continued, ends up taking Seattle to the playoffs, sets their franchise record for passing there in Seattle. Uh, pretty cool to see him get the cherry on top of all that. And, and win NFL Comeback Player of the Year. Oh, man, what an honor, right? I mean, to get the shot after grinding those for that first decade of of football and, and everybody kind of knows uh, really at any level, uh, it's a grind, right? And once you get to that level, it's cream of the crop. So being able to battle back and and, uh, and come back and have, and have a day, and I'm interested to see what uh what holds what holds bar there in seattle I'll see what uh see if they're going to uh show the me man. the money man show me the money show me the money man I mean, what's the guy the made money. his career 10 or 12 million dollars so far and which is nothing to sneeze at but by quarterback standards that's who've been in the league for a decade, money for quarterback that's going to be a fraction i think of what he's about to see and yeah. he's in good company joe burrow comeback player of the last year Alex yeah. Smith a couple years ago. Ryan uh, Tannehill. You know, yeah. Peyton Manning one year won this. It's mm -hmm. it's uh it's it, Tom Brady. I mean, this is yeah. the royalty of this list of guys that for various reasons with very various narratives behind them, but good for Gino. Um, uh, really excited for him. And and I hope this translates into a, a generational contract for him. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see, let's see a couple zeros, a couple commas on that yeah. contract, yeah. huh? <laughs> Um, and finally, kind of in our, our Mountaineers moving up here with some some big news for for Chuck Alley, for Gino starting the show. You know, we spent the last episode, maybe the first two minutes of episode 40, talking about you two guys going to the basketball game. So yeah. I think that's, a, you know, listen, this is a football podcast. But if, if, if we do 120 seconds of talking about WV hoops from time to time, that's all right, too. And, uh, and how about Joe Missoula? I mean, pretty darn cool. This guy, I mean, he was in college the same time Owen and I were. He, you know, started kind of when Owen was was leaving Morgantown, ended as I was getting to Morgantown, started his coaching career uh, in West Virginia, was at Fairmont State just a few years ago. And we all know, of course, he was the interim head coach of the Boston Celtics. Well, today, uh, Thursday, February 16th, depending on when you're listening to this, they stripped that interim tag, Joe Mazzulla being named the 19th head coach of the Boston Celtics and guys to me, you know, particularly for you and I, Owen, it's just really cool to have someone who's about our same relative age. Who's, who's now the head coach of one of the most historic franchises in American sports, right? It's like the Cowboys, the Yankees, the Steelers, the Lakers, the Celtics. I mean, yeah. they're on that short list, the Boston Celtics. It's pretty stinking cool. Oh, dude. I mean, and they're absolutely killing it right now. In the Best league. record in the league. Yeah. Like they're what, you know, batting over 700 for the, uh, for the year. So they're, I mean, they're absolutely slaying it. Number one in their league. Um, you know what I mean? It's awesome. It is. It's awesome. It's, it's, it's pretty cool to see there. And, and Jed, listen, I know you, you know, you joke a lot, like you've, you've forgotten or, or will forget more about basketball than you ever know. Right. Or whatever the, the joke that you made, but, and this is, uh, even if you're someone who's not super into basketball, it's just cool to see a guy who chipped away, earned his opportunity. He wasn't, you know, a five-star recruit coming out of high school. He had to earn every inch, every step, uh, every opportunity at WVU and then Fairmont State and climbing that ladder. And, and yeah, you could say right place, right time with everything that transpired with the Celtics this offseason. But for him to get this opportunity to run with it, like Owen said, and and have – uh, you know, his team, the Celtics, like they're not doing this just for a feel good story. They've got the best record in the NBA right now. It's, it's yeah. pretty cool to see this from Joe Missoula. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And, and, you know, it's the thing about it is Wes, we're all Mountaineer fans and I'm a Mountaineer fan. I'm right. a Mountaineer basketball fan, but I'm not going to pretend to be a Mountaineer basketball expert. That's something that I'm absolutely not. 
So I can talk about it just like any other fan can talk about it, right? Uh, enjoy it. When you think about when Joe Mazzola was here, the same gritty nature that made him kind of who he was when he was a Mountaineer uh, is how he persevered yeah, to get to where yeah. he is. I mean, they, they always say that what's luck? Luck's when preparation meets opportunity. Well, what greater example? This is exhibit A of that, right? I mean, it truly is. Absolutely. I mean, Mazzola stuck it out. He took the jobs to climb the ladder that were necessary made the most of those opportunities at each stop along the way. And the next thing you know, as you touched on, one of the most storied franchises in all of American sports. I mean, really. To be the Boston Celtics. So now, uh, you know, in, in the same hallowed grounds that Larry Bird and, <laughs> and Red Auerbach. It's crazy. Bill it's, Russell. It's crazy. I mean, Bill Russell, yeah. yeah. Now add Joe <laughs> Mazzola to the list. And again, he's not just <laughs> going through the motions. He's churning it out, as Owen touched on, at a clip of, of over 70%. I mean, he's getting it done. So it's very apparent that whatever he's doing in practice, whatever he's doing in, in the locker room, those guys are picking up what he's putting down. Uh, so I, I couldn't be more excited. I mean, I made a point, you know, uh, I tweeted something out and I was like, look, when you look at the stretch of what we've seen in the last six months, and it really came to mind uh, the other day when Chuck Halley, you know, uh, got the news that he got. And then, and then as you touched on today, Missoula gets that news. Well, Within the last six months, we've seen Hugs finally make it into the Naismith Hall of Fame, right? Yeah. We've seen Chuck Halley finally get the call. We've seen Missoula more than earn his way up to getting that interim tag removed. And as you touched on, look what Gino's done. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we, it's we cool. want wins on the floor. We want wins on the football field. We want all that, okay? But how about when we're struggling along the way, it's kind of a nice little secondary gift to still be getting these cool things in the offing while we're trying to work towards getting those wins in football and getting those wins currently in basketball. It's nice to have these things revisit us from the past and remind us what the, the legacy of West Virginia sports really is as well we're said. sticking around hoping to get those current wins. And not everybody has that. Not everybody has these cool little things popping up uh, out, of the, out of the offing uh, when they are struggling, trying to rebuild and turn the corner and get back to where they want to be. Well said. I think that's very well said, Jed. You're absolutely right. That's the, you know, that's the collegiate experience, right? We talk about yeah. that all the time, how, it's the, you know, the, the transfer portal and NIL, that's certainly one of the things that's changed. You know, it feels like the opportunities to watch guys be with your program for four or five years are going to become, you know, smaller and smaller. You'll still have program guys. Certainly you still will, but maybe not as, you know, as, as often as, as you always did in the past, but that's part of what makes this fun. You could talk about someone like Geno Smith. Now years later, you could talk about someone like Joe Missoula. Now years later, Chuck Halley, literally decades later, right? Yeah. That's that's I think that's part of you're right. It, it is. It, you, you always want the wins in the present, but being able to yeah. being able to see your own go to the next level, move on, have success, be recognized for it. I think that's part of the collegiate experience as well, too. I agree with that. And in other words, tracking uh, the careers and sometimes the glory of these former Mountaineers is a pretty cool experience. Yeah. And, uh, when we get to do it uh, kind of in bunches like this, it's even better. You know, Hogs was obviously more removed uh, on the timeline, but we've had three recently with yeah. Gino's story, uh, now with Chuck Halley's story, now with Missoula's story. It's kind of cool. Again, let's work towards getting back to finding a way to get the wins on the field and on the court. That's all true. That's obvious. Please, please don't state the obvious. We all know that. But meanwhile, as we're doing that, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the legacy left yeah. by some of these former well greats, or in the case of Hugs, a current great, you know, so. Well said. Absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking of wins, Jed, you had some interesting research as, as we roll along here. This is just going to kind of be, we've got some headlines here. We've got some former yeah. Mountaineers to discuss. This is a, you know, this is a, a wide palette uh, episode here. Um the new Big 12, you were able to find some stats. I believe someone someone put out on Twitter um, yeah. some some pretty cool, um, speaking of history and, and, and all these things that we were yeah. kind of just discussing, um, WVU kind of standing at the top of the pack uh, of this new Big 12 that we will have, you know, once Texas and Oklahoma exit in 2024. Uh, very true. Uh, there's a Twitter account. Uh, it's a, a Cincinnati fan, at Bearcat MTA. Uh, and this account posted some information. Now, let's clarify. When we say new Big 12 at this juncture, that can mean a couple different things, right? I mean, <laughs> this year we're playing with a 14-team Big 12. Moving forward in what will 
uh, be the true new Big 12. It'll be a dozen teams absent Texas and Oklahoma. So when you look at those dozen teams, including the four newcomers, BYU, Houston, Central Florida, and Cincinnati, what this at Bearcat MTA did was he compiled what the all-time win list will look like in terms of who ranks where in the new Big 12. So guess who ranks number one with 774 all-time wins? West Virginia. Number two, TCU, 679, nearly 100 behind us, all the way down to UCF, ranking number 12 at 289. Now, if you're thinking, well, that's because we've been playing football since shortly after the Civil War ended, a couple decades (laughs) after the Civil War ended, right? UCF, not so much. They're kind of a newcomer. All right. Well, let's take a take a look at how we how things rank in terms of all time winning percentage. Okay. Okay. All time winning percentage, ranking number one at fifty nine and a half percent in terms of we you know we won fifty nine and a half percent of our games. West Virginia, number one. BYU, number two at five eighty one. Uh, UCF, number three, again, they haven't been around as long, but they made a lot of it, made a lot of hay in that short time. 561, all the way down. Who do you think think ranks 12th in the new Big 12? You could probably, if you spend a couple minutes thinking about it. Kansas, Kansas. uh, No, think about longer term history than Kansas. Kansas had the Gail Sayers days. Kansas, Mm, that's true. Is it it UCF? No, no, no. UCF's number three. It's Iowa State. Iowa State. Iowa State. Uh, Iowa State had like one solid decade in the 70s uh, and, you know, had a, 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 a really a long dead period before Matt Campbell arrived. But uh, just some interesting numbers that were compiled by a Cincinnati fan. And it's one different way to look at the, uh, at the new Big 12. Again, of course, West Virginia you would expect us to compile more wins because we played football for so long. What's more impressive is the percentage ranks number one in the new Big 12 as well all time. And that, that says a lot. No, that's that's pretty cool. That is that is to know that you're kind of, you know, on on the top of both of those all time wins and then win percentage as well too. And hey, let's uh, let's hope that we can start flexing that muscle here, baby, yeah. on some of our uh, some of our new Big Twelve brethren. Because you're right. Listen, Cincinnati, I understand they've had some success lately. Obviously, they went to the College Football Playoff just a year ago. Um, some of these, I mean, listen, I mean, a lot, a lot of UCF fans have been running their mouths in the, in the big 12 sphere here over the last few months, a lot of uh, Houston fans as well, too. Let's uh, let's keep it that way. Keep them in for a, for a rude awakening here when things get rolling in the fall. And then ultimately when we sue, we Where's do UCF say goodbye. Fans? Wes, yeah. it seems like they're mouthy, UCF man. Fans. They found a way to upset like the other 11 fan bases already. Oh, yeah. it's, it's already. Yeah. already. Yeah. I even saw you guys will laugh at this because you UCF and Pitt like uh, a few years ago played a couple years in a row in football. Right. Yeah. Um, like just before the pandemic, I think it was UCF and Pitt had a had a series and there were a lot of back and forth games in that series, a lot of close games. And so there was some bickering that went on between UCF and Pitt fans in those years. Well, I saw a Pitt fan on Twitter this past week, Jed, I kid you not, who was like, yo, UCF, you don't want this smoke with WVU. All right, like pick another target. (laughs) WVU fans will wreck you. Like you are not ready for this. All right, I'm telling you, pick another target. Like you guys don't want this smoke. (laughs) Well, Wes, wasn't it, correct me if I'm wrong, when we set the record in the season opener at Pitt for the largest crowd to ever attend a sporting event in the history of the city of Pittsburgh, I think we broke the Pitt UCF record, right? I, oh, no, that's right. They only had like 1,700 people at that game. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Right? Uh, yeah, I, knew there, uh, I, knew there, I knew there I knew there. had to be a joke in there. I knew there had to be a joke in there. <laughs> hey, um, speaking of new Big 12 and all these things, I think we should. This is probably a good time to note as well, too, Jed. Uh, uh-huh. Texas and Oklahoma have finalized their departure to the SEC. They have. Uh, you know, Brett Yormark has some priorities set in place, right? And it's kind of interesting how he's following his game plan or his template. Priority number one was a new TV deal. Well, he checked that box many months ago as we talked about ad nauseum on this very podcast. Uh, priority number two was to address the situation with Oklahoma and Texas. Now, he only wanted them leaving before that June of 2025 cutoff, which would have been the life of the contract, the original contract, the original commitment, if it was in the best interest of the Big 12. And he felt that it was. They struck a deal. And Texas and Oklahoma will be leaving. This was 
news a week or two ago, but it's the off season. So we kind of gather our breath and talk about it at our leisure, right? So they will be leaving early. This will be their final season in the Big 12. So it appears that we've made our last trip to DKR. Of course, we're going to Norman this year, right? So they're leaving. They're going to pay $100 million to the Big 12. Now, part of that money will go to Fox to offset the law. Forfeited TV revenue, That's right, right? The yeah. Oklahoma-Texas TV inventory that Fox will no longer get. And in a weird, quirky way, part of this was contingent on Michigan and Texas being able to flip that home and home series they have. Like they had to reverse the order. It gets pretty complicated hmm. in terms of ESPN being involved, Fox being involved. Sure, sure. But part of it was contingent on that. But yes, this will be the final season for Oklahoma and Texas. No shocker there. Uh, and the new 12 team Big 12 that we talked about, absent Oklahoma and Texas, uh, will kick off in 2024. So the hundred million dollars coming our way again, part of it back to uh, to Fox to uh, to make them whole. But that was some news in, in recent weeks as well. Well, without Texas on the schedule this year, I guess the good news remains that we shall stay the only Big Twelve program that doesn't have a losing record against Texas. Hmm. How about now how about that? Yeah. How about that? It's five hundred, but we're yeah. the only one in the conference that doesn't have an all-time losing record to Texas, and they're not going to have a chance to change that this year, unless we see them in the Big Twelve championship game. That I, you know, yeah. you never, yeah, never, you say, never, say you never, never say never, never say never, never say never. So we, yeah, that is that has been finalized. Wanted to make sure we hit on that uh, today as well. Before we talk about a couple other former Mountaineers who are moving and shaking in their uh, collegiate coaching rankings as well, too here. We do have to give some Super Bowl thoughts in this episode, right? Whenever the uh, the biggest of big games finishes up, particularly when it's uh, got some some members on both sides that our own Big O has connections to. Uh, to me, gentlemen, that was everything the NFL could have hoped for in a Super Bowl in two parts. One, because it was a great game. And two, because it had controversy at the end. And make no mistake about it, the NFL is a billion-dollar entertainment business and they don't care about the result being they care about the result being fair in terms of the overall integrity of the of the product but that's exactly what the NFL wants they want a great game and they want a little controversy to go with it because that's what gets the most people talking and watching and listening and writing about it um and that to me is what it was it was an all-time Super Bowl but one that had an ending that will be discussed and debated for a while um but to me that was that was a fun football game to to sit down and watch. And I think one that, you know, that we'll remember for a long time. Yeah, that was a heck of a game. A lot of fun to watch. Uh, two quarterbacks battling. Yeah. Um, Jalen really, in my opinion, you know, being him, just bringing it. He played Obviously well. Obviously had he did. a great game. You know, I played very well. Uh, unfortunately had, you know, a, uh, a football story. Hopefully, you know, I'm, uh, in my opinion, they'll be back, uh, or they'll be back in a couple of years. He's going to be a guy that's going to be tough to be around. Um, and then Mahomes, you know, just being magical, him and Travis and, and that whole crew just absolutely dominate and come back in the second quarter there and and, uh, and finishing the game up. And, you know, the call, you know, you say what you want to say. Um, I think what he did was, you know, I love the seeing the quote that, uh, you know, I did pull on the jersey. Uh, you know, I mean, it is what it is. It is what it is. You know, what I mean, in my opinion, there was plays that could have been made well before that. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, adjustments, you know, made. Uh, they were killing them on that inside motion back to the flat. Uh, a lot of sure. miscommunication in the in the, the defensive uh backfield there which was uh you know an adjustment they just didn't make and they got killed on it they sure did you know a couple of things that stood out to me uh first of all how many times have we seen this the, the football gods don't like not making the most of your opportunities they so when you have somebody against the ropes right <laughs> and you don't put them away you don't put the boot to their throat right that that so often comes back to haunt you. Now, what made this a little different to me in the first half, on the one hand, it kind of felt like the Eagles were dominating. It kind of felt like the Eagles had a chance to put them away. But on the other hand, there was a part of me that's like, why can't the Eagles run the football? Why is Jalen Hurts so often forced off script? 
to ad lib and play backyard football to, to move them down the field while it feels like they're dominating, while it feels like they're dominating. It wasn't like they were following the offensive game plan. It, there were some quirky, weird things going the Eagles' way in large measure because the way Jalen Hurts was playing, right? Yeah, yeah. And now yeah. I always say this. When you score on defense, pay very close attention because that's a blade that cuts both ways. Now, we like to talk about, you know, in real time, Patrick Mahomes being on the bench for 23 minutes. Well, one of the things that happened in that first half was he wasn't on the field in part because their defense scored. And the Eagles came right back out after, you know, Patrick Mahomes extensively being on the sidelines. The, the Chiefs defense scored and the Eagles got another drive going. So be careful. Yes, yeah. deep, any touchdowns great. But when your defense scores, be careful of the impact it has on both your offense and its lack of ability to find continuity and the other team's offense and its chance to get lathered up. That's one thing that stood out. The other thing that stood out was when the Chiefs got the ball to start the second half, down 10, and Andy Reid, oh, and you played for the guy. You know how he thinks. When Andy Reid came out running the football, they ran the ball eight, nine times in those first two possessions of the second half, trailing for almost 60 yards or so. I was like, wow, Andy Reid sees something. So an Eagles team that couldn't run the football – is now facing a Chiefs a team that's finding ways to do so. Yeah. So that kind of told me something. I was like, wow, that is a weird feeling if you're an Eagles fan. And then finally, Owen, you touched on the call. A couple interesting points about the call. There were nine flags in this game, okay? Six of those flags, first of all, that's not a lot, right? It's not, no. Six of those flags were pre-snap. So in other words, it's almost situations where the officials are forced to get involved. Fall yeah, you got to delay a game yeah, or offsides or false so that starts, yeah. Let them play, dog. Let yes. them. Play, dog. That means only three times all night did a judgment call impact the play post snap. One of those three was the call we're talking about. Now, so often people say, when that circumstance, you got to keep it in your pocket. You can't impact the final end, the end of the game like that. Under those circumstances, oh, and how many times we said it. Every play can impact a football game. So the argument on the other side will be if you're if you're going to call that on the third play of the game after a kickoff, do you not have to call it on the third to, to last play of the game? So that, that's one way of thinking about it, right? But the truth of the matter is, as you touched on, you had many opportunities leading up to that. Uh, kudos to him for admitting, hey, I did tug the jersey. Now, yeah. the problem yeah. was what I saw going viral on Twitter was he held him twice. And what was being tweeted was the second hold, which wasn't really that egregious, and it was hard to see. No. What wasn't being tweeted was the first hold the first at the front end of the jersey. Now, Owen, you know better this, this better than anybody. There's two ways to hold somebody. One's a tight grip with a clenched fist in which you don't see jersey, and the other one is a loose grip in which you do see jersey. And nine out of ten times when you see jersey, that's going to result in the flag. It didn't help the NFL's cause that the best shot that I've seen came from NFL Films. And in the background, have you guys seen this? In the background of that call came a hands to the face against one of the Eagles pass rushers, which wasn't called. So there's we live in a very, very flawed world, and, and officials are flawed people just like we are. They're going to miss things. They're going to see things. Uh, your job as an official is to not be disgusted after the game. Great, fair enough. But you saw that. You called that. So here we are. What was interesting, I, I don't want this to, to go unsaid about McKinnon. Now, I heard you know Travis Kelsey discussing at the post game that it was discussed in the huddle. Look, anybody gets the ball down around the one, don't score. And it was very obvious. Go back and watch it if you didn't see it in real time. Mm -hmm. The Eagles were trying to let them score because they recognized the situation. Look, if, if, if they don't We got to get the ball back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, interestingly enough, it's all about playing the odds. So, the question became – if you're Andy Reid, what does playing the odds mean? Winding the clock down and letting a kicker who already had one bounce off the upright try and kick the game winner on a, a slick field in which people are look like the ice capades? Do you really want <laughs> yeah. your kicker deciding the game in that circumstance? He thought the odds were best to do that. I, look, I wouldn't have judged him if on second down – he did take the knee on second down. But on second down, instead of taking a conventional knee where your quarterback retreats four yards and then ducks down – how about taking a one-yard knee, taking 40 seconds off? And the then trying to run it. Yeah. And then score with 38 seconds left. And now the Eagles are down seven with no timeouts left on a slippery field, but it's slippery for the defense too. So it worked, so it's hard to question it. It worked. He felt mm -hmm. that playing the odds was 
the short field goal under those circumstances. I just thought, man, your kicker, you know how those kickers get on. You already had one bounce off the upright. You're playing on a slick field. You see kickers almost breaking their ankle on kickoffs, right? So it worked out for the Chiefs in the end. But, you know, Wes, as you touched on, the NFL does love controversy because how many times since Sunday night have people been discussing that oh, very small or not? Dominating headlines, yeah. Games? Yeah, it has been. So it turned into a great game. Uh, you know, I just I just think that America at large wanted to see Jalen Hurts with the football in his hands and a chance to tie it. And I think yep. we it would have probably been overtime. Had that oh, been man, I wanted to see it so bad. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I think you know, it's time here. We all kind of feel oh, like I just want right? to see but, this play out. But you know, Wes, you were right. You, you, you talked last week about giving the Chiefs the edge because they were so battle-tested. I went and I leaned toward the Eagles' defense. You know what this did to me, Owen? I walked out of this game thinking, you know what? If the Eagles are in the AFC, am I talking so much about their defense? Eh, hmm. Maybe not. It's tough if to judge off of one game, game sample size, yeah. but you know, but well, you're right. They're yeah. facing the AFC's quarterbacks instead of yeah. who they did face. Right. You know? Right. Because you, you look at the quarterbacks they face behind Mahomes, the next one, you got to drop off to Dak to, to look at the second best that's quarterback true. they that's face true. this year. That's if you're true. in the AFC, that's not the case. So yeah. anyway. Here we are. I mean, you could, yeah, you're right. You could argue Aaron Rodgers was the second best quarterback they faced all yeah. year. And yeah. we all, I think we all agree that he's taken a, he's not the same Aaron Rodgers that that's he's right. been throughout yeah. the majority of his career, but that, no, that's a great point by you too. That's interesting. I it's, it's weird because you, you sit back and you feel like Eagles probably should have won that game, you know, uh, up 10 at halftime really just felt like they controlled it for the majority of the time. But you, you guys, I, I'm sure you probably know this stat. In the NFL, your defense scores a touchdown 80% of the time you win the game. Mm-hmm. Oh, in, the, in, the, in the NFL, your special team scores a touchdown 80% of the time you win the game. And Kadarius Tony, I mean, he took that ball inside the 10-yard line and they scored two plays later. I mean, that was essentially a special team score. For those two things to happen for the Chiefs and the Eagles to still be leading or still be right at, like yeah. – that to me, I mean, those were two complete football teams because most of the time, if you have a team gets a defensive touchdown and a pseudo special teams touchdown, that's a, a double digit victory for that team. Um, those, I mean, I, I don't know, Big O, would you I'll I mean, maybe maybe, I, maybe I not next year, but it could be could be these two teams have, again. I won't have the final word here. I'll close with this: the reason I didn't feel in the end that game was a fluke or an aberration is because I did feel the Chiefs won the line of scrimmage. I oh, did. Yeah. Yeah. They ran the ball. The Eagles didn't. That, that was the most surprising thing to me. Uh, Patrick Mahomes didn't hit the turf once all night. Uh, now, granted, part of that was they didn't have to throw the ball as much because they established the run game. I thought the Chiefs controlled the line of scrimmage. And anytime yeah. that's happened, it's going to be hard for me to walk away saying, wow, how fluky. You controlled the line of scrimmage and want no. I'm sorry. That's, that's what convinced me. Yeah, and you uh... – can't count out old Big Red, man. He's the uh, <laughs> master of disaster. Dude. Those, did you guys see that that corn dog? Did you see the clip of him talking about corn dog, that adjustment that they scored on twice in the second half with motion? Did you guys see that? I didn't see him talking about it, but if anybody to... was listening at home, it was fascinating what happened was he, he yeah. took the motion out wide. In other words, he had Kelsey in the slot, and he had the wide out motion in toward Kelsey – and he recognized, look, the secondary is going to be forced to communicate and switch off. They're switching right off. at this yeah. sweet spot. That, right when the communication was made defensively, is when he kicked the motion back toward the flat to use their own communication against them. It was brilliant. I Amazing. think Andy Reid had as much to do with that win as Patrick Mahomes or anybody else. So I'm saying he's a, uh, he, man, the guy is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And, and he said too, Jet, you know, maybe – if that's if that's the NFC Championship game, AFC Championship game, if it's a regular season game, Andy Reid said in the post game, he said, "Hey, we needed the time to figure that stuff out and and break that down during halftime." And he said, "You know, you get ten extra. You, you know, your normal halftime is fifteen minutes. Well, it's twenty five minutes oh, in the Super Bowl, right?" So yeah. he he Andy Reid talked about that post game too. Who was like he was like, "Hey, we were fortunate that we had the extra time during halftime and we were able to to flush that thing out." Normal because it, I mean, it was it was a minutes. master it was a masterful way to get the Eagles to play their hand down near down near the goal line. Twenty nine minute halftime. Owen, you know, I've talked to Bruce Server and some others when he comes back for games about how you blink and an NFL halftime's over. It's so much shorter than college, even right. Well, a couple things happened. Yes, they had time to strategize and compare notes, but something else: the Chiefs' defense spent 
the entire first half on the field. And you telling me that those 17 minutes of extra real-time rest didn't matter at halftime? Big yes, time. they absolutely Big did. Time. And now you start the second half resting as your offense is getting drives together. So that you're right. That that extended halftime played a critical role. Whew. Gotta love it. Gotta love when there's a like that's just my I you know, this was a Super Bowl filled, jam-packed with storylines and different things to discuss. And I think it, it did. It lived up to the hype in that regard. And it was. It was a fun one and one that I think will add respect for Jalen Hurts. I'll say that. We'll remember. Oh, me too. Me too. Yeah. He, he, that's why that's why if I'm, you know, like my wife, my wife might be able to hear me screaming and yelling upstairs. Uh, yeah. my, my wife's from Philadelphia. She loves the Eagles. Her family has season tickets. They were devastated on she was devastated on Sunday night. But that's what I told her Monday morning. I was like, hey, I was like, you're in a good spot going forward with with Jalen Hurts, yeah. with a lot of the young pieces you guys have on this team. I, I think the Eagles will be back there uh, if or, or when the, not if uh, maybe next year, maybe two, three years, whatever it may be. But I think you're right. Jalen Hurts answered a lot of questions and to be able to do so after that fluke fumble and scoop six for him to continue chucking along, I I thought was impressive resilience on his part as well, too. A couple more here as we wrap this up, gentlemen, Uh, but before we do so real quick, I wanted to uh, give a shout out to GoMart for being a presenting sponsor of this episode of ITG GoMart here to keep you going. Make sure you're signing up for your GoMart rewards as you travel throughout the mountain state. Uh, More ears on the move. Jed, uh, some former um, Mountaineer coaches, uh, some former uh, some former coordinators and position coaches of this parish. Miami has hired Shannon Dawson, uh, and Notre Dame has promoted uh, Jared Parker to offensive coordinator. I'll let you speak about both these guys individually, Jed. All I'm going to say is, Jared, Jared, if you're if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, Jared, you better hang fifty on Pitt this fall, buddy. All right? Yeah. Well, let's start with that. Okay. Jared Parker is a guy who he has a history with Marcus Freeman, right? I mean, they were at Purdue together. It wasn't an accident that he landed at Notre Dame when he did, but there's an interesting dynamic to this hire. He's been promoted from tight end coach to OC, right? Meanwhile, and this is kind of what snuck under the radar. Gina Gadulli, who Mountaineer fans remember is the former Cincinnati quarterback. Oh, and I think you just missed him. He was coming out of Cincinnati as you were arriving in West Virginia. But Mountaineer fans recognize him. We faced him a couple times back in the early 2000s. Gina Gadulli is a guy who was with Luke Fickle at Wisconsin on that staff because he was, for the last two years, the play caller on the Cincinnati staff for Luke Fickle. So very interesting that the quarterback coach from Cincinnati who went to Wisconsin for a couple months, former play caller the last couple years, is now coaching the quarterbacks at Notre Dame that I say former play caller. (laughs) Meanwhile, Jared Parker, has he called plays? Has he not? There were, there were spurts when he was at West Virginia where, yeah, he was more than contributing. Okay. In terms of down the stretch his last year here, but, but uh, so an interesting dynamic there within the staff, I think that's going to serve that staff very well. Uh, Meanwhile, Shannon Dawson, when you look at the ACC at large, okay. You know what the ACC hasn't had a lot of that the rest of college football in the landscape has on some level? An infusion of air raid philosophies, right? You really haven't. When you look up and down, I mean, some guys have kind of crossed paths with some air, air raid mentors, but nobody is really old school air raid the way that I would consider Shannon Dawson. But don't look now. In one off season, Garrett Riley, pure air, air raid as they come, leaves TCU you know, after being with Sonny Dykes and doing what they did. So now you're going to have an infusion of air raid philosophies at Clemson. And in the same off season down in Miami, Shannon Dawson is an old school air raid guy. He was, you know, a quarterback at Wingate goes way back with Dana uh, spent the last couple of years as a quarterback coach and OC down there, but you're just not going to get a lot of credit if you're an OC for Dana Holgerson, right? It's just one of those situations. So like being an offensive coordinator for Andy Reid, you're not getting a lot that's of credit. Right. That's right, which is why there's talk that the enemy might land in Washington. They might leave, Rivera, yeah, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so off to Miami he goes, but in one off season, here's two major players in the ACC that very much appear poised to adopt air raid offensive philosophy. So let's see how that goes. Yeah, that'll that'll be that'll be interesting. And Big O, hey, we always always got to keep an eye on those those former Mountaineers, right? It's the life of the coaching tree. <laughs> it sure is. That it sure is. It absolutely is. All right. As we wrap this up, last thing here on our 
Mountaineers moving up slash miscellaneous headlines episode of, of ITG here. Jed, I feel like we've done a lot of good news on this episode. I talked about Chuck and we talked about Gino and we talked about Joe Mazzola, right? A lot yeah. of a lot of good, a lot of good news. WVU, new Big 12, most wins, highest winning percentage. Well, then I guess it's only right that you whack us with a hammer before we get out of here. Uh 2023 strength of schedule rankings for college football. And I've got some bad news, folks, but things ain't getting easier for the Mountaineers. Uh, they're not. Uh Phil Steele. Uh, puts this out about this time each year. It's pretty big news when he does. Uh, what he does is he compiles the win-loss record uh, of each team's opponents for the following year. So he's looking ahead to 2023 to see what your opponents did in 2022. West Virginia ranks number three nationally in terms of the third toughest schedule in the country. Uh, South Carolina is number one. Michigan State's number two. Uh, West Virginia, the, the win percentage of West Virginia's opponents next year, 62.4%. We face 11 bowl teams in 12 games. Obviously, we have the one FCS game. So that means every FBS team we're facing went to a bowl last year. Okay, now, a couple things to consider. When you're five and seven, you don't get to play yourself, right? <laughs> so that makes your schedule a little tougher, okay? Because it's no accident that four and eight Iowa State is also uh, among the three toughest schedules in the Big 12. But what really drives this thing isn't the fact that you're not playing yourself at five and seven. It's that you are playing what looks to be a top 10, maybe even top five Penn State team non-conference. You're playing a Pitt team non-conference that won nine games. So meanwhile, just for example, okay, I was discussing this with a, a friend of mine. I mentioned this to you, Wes. He's, a, he's an Auburn grad, big Auburn booster. Uh, you know, he said, you know, he thought it was laughable that West Virginia had the third toughest schedule. I'm like, look, you can't see the forest for the trees. You're an Auburn <laughs> guy. Your own schedule has UMass, Cal, Samford, not Stanford, Samford, the one I used to play at, okay? <laughs> Vandy, in conference, obviously, and New Mexico State. You're starting that's off five, That's five wins. wins right there. You're starting your season with five wins. I don't care if you play the okay. Chiefs in your other seven games. You yes. should still make a bowl game. <laughs> so, you know, West Virginia has the one FCS game against Duquesne, okay? Where's the other four automatics like Auburn has? But where's, so any, it, when he, where's any other one automatic? <laughs> well, there, there you go. So it's, it's going to be immensely challenging. But when you look at how things fall for the Big 12, okay, guess who ranks 105th in the country in strength of schedule? And dead last in this year's 14 team Big 12, TCU. Again, mm. in part because they're not playing. Because they're TCU, not playing themselves. Right? Yep. Sure, yeah. Sure, and sure, playing sure. TCU beefs up your schedule. Well, TCU's not playing TCU except outside of their spring game, which doesn't count. Right. So they're not playing one of the two toughest teams in the Big 12 because they can't. All right. But again, when you look at their non conference schedule, those guys kind of get it, they understand how to schedule non league. They set, they set themselves up for success last year. So a couple layups early on to really get crowd. You know, you had a new staff. So what they did was they set themselves up with some pretty easy non-conference wins and start believing, get lathered up. Next thing you know, you look up your 3-0, your 4-0, turns into 5-0. That becomes reality. So TCU, 105th in the country in terms of strength of schedule, in part because they're not playing TCU, Okay. But 14, they're also not playing Penn State and Pitt. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. That's that's what drives this equation the most. Yes. yes, it factors in that West Virginia doesn't get to play a five and seven West Virginia and TCU doesn't get to play a 12, 13 win TCU. That factors in. But what you just hit on, Wes, drives this more than anything. Your non-conference schedule against Penn State and against Pitt is truly what drives this more than anything else. So. Something to consider. So what that means is I see a tremendous opportunity for West Virginia. If you want to put a silver lining on it, that's one way to put a silver lining on it. You mm -hmm. can't choose the schedule. You can't pick the schedule. Oh, and you know better than most. Uh, we're going to do a, an episode just on West Virginia's history against top 25 teams at some point here coming up soon. Uh, oh, and you were seven and two against top 25 teams. And if you want to know why Mountaineer fans love you and Pat White, <laughs> that's why. It's so unusual. Oh, yeah. It's so wild. If you yep. look at our history, it's so incredibly unusual to do that, right? Owen's, Owen's probably got 40% of those top 25 wins. <laughs> Maybe. So It was good times. There you go. But, good but uh, yeah, you got to make the most of a tough schedule. 
And yeah. the good news is that means weekend, we, can, we you got out, some opportunities for some big wins, like yep. crazy. So just think what happens if you string together a couple and get on a roll and have a good season against this schedule, what that means. That's a pretty compelling story. So there's opportunities there. Yeah. Thanks to Phil Steele for once again, putting that together and giving us something to talk about in yet another week during the off season. It's the, it's the blessing and the curse. It's like the same thing yeah. we talk about with the basketball team, right? Yeah. The, the bad news is you literally don't have any layups on your schedule. There's not a one. The, the good news is, though, every single game, you've got an opportunity to make a statement and make some noise. Adapt or die, man. Adapt or die. Adapt or die. And hopefully it starts with us adapting Labor Day weekend in State College. Yeah, I start adapting in State College. That's that's quite an adaptation right there. Stinking, uh, stinking nitty so. lot. Can that game just be Saturday at noon? Please, for the love of God. We don't, It doesn't need to be a Thursday prime time. It doesn't need to be Sunday, Monday <laughs> prime time. Just Saturday at noon. Please, football gods. It, you know it's going to be prime time, white out, 100,000. Oh, you know. yeah, yeah. And then when they come back to Morgantown in 2024, it'll be at noon on a Saturday. Saturday at noon. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's what I'm ready, man. I'm ready. I'm Um, ready regardless. I'm ready. I'm ready regardless. I was dead. I was, I was going through my desk. It is. It's a great opportunity. I've got a, I've got a desk calendar here, right? Where I kind of put vacation dates and important birthdays and and all different kinds of stuff. And I was marking down Labor Day weekend, September 2nd. I'll be in happy Valley. I can't wait, baby. It's going to be a lot of fun. Certainly going to be a lot of fun. Um, thanks. This was this was a fun episode, guys. I liked how we just did this kind of bouncing around a few different topics to chew on and discuss. And we kind of round balled it. You know, we just yeah, we, we just threw the we threw the thing around a little bit. And I think this ended up being a uh, enjoyable episode. We're going to get some guests lined up. We right? are. Yes. Talking about it before we the were show. doing some. some uh, we'll some surprise planning. you with some pretty cool guests and. And even if it's guests that have been on other podcasts, we want to have a conversation with them that's that's patently unlike the conversations you've heard on other podcasts, right? Yes, so yes. we will. We, we like, like we've said, even though it's the off season, we got some great stuff for you. Speaking of great stuff, Jed's been cranking out these YouTube shorts. Make sure you're checking those out on our YouTube page at In the Gun Podcast, as uh, as there's some pretty cool things from from WVU schedule to some history and trivia stuff that the Jet has on there. All pretty cool stuff uh, on our YouTube page at In the Gun Podcast. Thanks to Fortis for presenting this episode as well to Roof Performance and Financial Certainty Guaranteed. Visit Fortis.us.com. Fellas, this was good stuff. We will reconvene next weekend and then two weeks from now. I will be in Indianapolis for the combine where hopefully I will, uh, I will be able to get us some cool content and worst case scenario, I'll have a cool view in my hotel room where you guys can see Lucas oil stadium behind me when we're broadcasting. So what's the dates uh, on that real quick, Wes, February 27th. That's coming to March to March 4th. I'll be there Monday to Saturday in Indy. That's coming so fast. I got, I got space in my room, big O, if you want to come crash, you know, (laughs) he'll get you fired (laughs) (laughs) no way i'll be like this guy this guy he used to be he used to be one of the cattle that they would herd around here right bring you here and weigh you bring you here and measure you bring you here and do this and that all right owen got owen had to be livestock at this thing back in the day he could at least go and enjoy himself this time um but plenty coming here as always uh on itg Make sure you're checking out our YouTube page. Like I said, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, In the Gun Podcast. That's where you find us, itgfootball.com. And as always, the one thing we ask of you is to spread the good word of this WVU football podcast. Be an ear and tell an ear about uh, all the fun things we're doing here on ITG. For Jed Drenning and Owen Schmidt, I'm Wesley Euler. Thanks for listening as everybody, and we'll talk to you next time. You've been In the Gun.